Um, 2 Samuel chapter 23, um, I, I preached a couple weeks ago, and, I, and I, maybe a month ago, but I preached about the, the King James Bible, and I preached about His Holy Word, and I preached about David's mighty men. And David had a mighty man, that uh, one of his mighty men, that he had fought so long with the sword, and he had killed so many men, and he had fought so long that his hand cramped up. And the Bible says that his hand claved to the sword. So um, I kind of, uh, while I was doing that, uh, studying that and preparing for that and looking at that and learning that and listening to that I, and, 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 and seeing those things, I noticed that, that there are, there was, I, I'm like, where did he get his mighty men? I always, uh, I've heard preachers preach on his mighty men. I've heard him talk about his mighty men. And I've always heard him talk about David's mighty men. And I thought, where did he get them? Where did he get these mighty men? David has taken his last breath in 2 Samuel chapter 23. He knew his time was short. And he began to talk about his mighty men. He named them one by one. I, I, I read you 22. But, it, but in 23, um, where I preached at a couple a month or so ago, he talked about his mighty men. And, he, and he, he was going back and he was reminiscing. And he was talking about Eleazar. And he was talking about all these men. And, and I'm sure he was kind of smiling and chuckling and thinking about them. David had some mighty men. Now some people say there were 400 mighty men. Some people say there were 800. There's all kinds of different accounts and different uh, ways that they count this up. Uh, uh, that, that's kind of nitpicky. And uh, I guess we can go deep into the scriptures and figure that out. But uh, uh, there, the, right here it says there were 400 of them. And um, they, were, uh, they were so loyal to him. They were mighty men that, that they, would, they would do anything for him. Uh, David had a quality about him. He had, a, he had something, God, a God-given gift that men would follow him. Men would be loyal to him. Men would follow him into battle and they would give their lives for him. They would do anything for him. He had this quality about him. And I think that's kind of a Christian quality. I think we should have a kind of Christian kind of quality. The way that we call our friends, they're there for us. When we call people and we need help, they're there for us. And the way we do that, I believe the Bible teaches us, and it's, and it's true that the way that we get them to be there for us is we should be there for them every opportunity we can. And every time we can help someone, and every time we can take care of someone, that's what we should do. But David had this quality where he could get men to follow him. They were drawn to him. They were, he brought out the best in them. They wanted to be loyal to him. They wanted to do mighty things for him. They wanted to follow him. They would die for him. They loved him. Something about him that made him loyal to him. Where did he get his mighty men? Did he get them at West Point of his day, back in the day, back in the Bible days? Did he get them at the West Point Military Academy? No. Did he get them at the Virginia Military Institute, VMI? Did he get them in that of his day? No. Did he get them at the Air Force Academy? No, he didn't get them there. Did he get them in, I had a cousin that actually went to Annapolis. Did he get them in Annapolis, the Naval Academy? No, that's not where he got them. It tells us here in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 1 and 2, where did they came from? Where did they come from? Where did David get his mighty men? David therefore departed thence and escaped the cave of Dulam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. Where did he get such a loyal man that would kill 800 people for him at one time? The Bible says that one man slew 800 at one time. Where would he get these mighty men? He got, them from, he, he got these men from, from, the, from right here. Everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was in discontented. Where would he get these men that would fight for him till their hand would clave to the sword? Where would he get these men that were so loyal that they'd follow him into any kind of battle anywhere? I remember the Bible talking about how he was thirsty and a bunch of men, they broke through enemy lines in the middle of the night and snuck through just to get him a water. Just to get him a drink of water from a, from a certain uh, uh, area of water inside, inside the, their hometown that was in camp. And that's the kind of men that were willing to follow David. And David had the ability to bring out the best in him. He had the ability to, 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 to have people follow him and have people die for him. I think that was his anointing. I think that was when God's power came upon him. God's Holy Spirit rested upon him. I think that's what happened. And I think that's why they were willing to do that. Now... Uh, Everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. Debt. The, the, the men that were in debt. 
I think this is one of the world's most evils nowadays. I think we got a problem with debt in this country. I think that debt is looked upon as nothing. I remember back in the day, even my mom and dad, I mean, they used to, just debt was, a, was an ugly, ugly word. My dad hated to be in debt. He hated to owe anybody anything. And I think this day and age, I think because of the way the government's acting, the way they're writing checks that they can't cash, that everybody's in debt and nobody cares. And I'm telling you, that's not about the Bible. I'm telling you right now, the, the, the United States country, the country of the United States is now in debt to a communist country. We're now in debt to several communist countries. We got so much debt, I think the debt ticker, it keeps going up and up and up. And we don't see anything wrong with it. And I think there's something wrong with being in debt. People used to be put in jail for being in debt. Now, I'm not talking about, all right, you buy a car, you got to borrow the money. I'm talking about massive amounts of debt where you cannot make that payment and you don't plan on making that payment and you don't care. You're like, oh, well, let them come after me. That's not right. That's not being a good Christian. We're trying to pay our debts. We're trying not to get into debt like that. We're trying not to do those kind of things. And I understand that sometimes you have to. There are emergencies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... Knowing that you're not ever going to be able to make that payment and not making it. In England, people were put in prison in it for it. John Wesley's dad, he spent life in prison for not paying his debt. Nobody's word means anything in this country anymore. If you don't believe me, you, you ought to go buy a house or you ought to go buy some that. You gotta you gotta sign thirty thousand papers. There was a day in this country where, where you could you could buy something with a handshake, where you could buy something with your word. I give you my word, I'll pay you back on the thirtieth. I give you my word that I'll do this in that minute. David took these dinner, debtors, he took these discontented, he took these outcasts. And he made an army that would live and die for David. That's what he did. He took these debtors. He took these outcasts. Now, the word outcast is mentioned eight times in the Bible. Eight times in the Bible. I looked it up and I've been doing studies on that. Who's God, who's God going to use? Who's God going to use in this day and age? God's going to use a bunch of outcasts. You don't believe me, look at the Bible. That's what the whole Bible's about. It's about a bunch of outcasts being able to do something for God. A bunch of people that nobody care about, cares about. A bunch of people that nobody wants. That's what God wants. In Jeremiah 49, 36, it's called the outcast of Elam. In Isaiah 27, 13, the outcast shall worship in the holy mountain. Psalm 147, verse 2, he gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. In Isaiah 11, 12, and shall assemble the outcasts. Isaiah 56, 8, he gathereth the outcast. Outcast, outcast. That's what he wants to use. Isaiah 16, 3, hide the outcast. Isaiah 16, 4, let mine outcast dwell with me. Who was Dwight L. Moody? Who was the, the, the man that changed England, changed, changed part of America? Who was that guy? He was, he was an outcast. He couldn't even pass the examination to get ordained. He was an outcast. He was kicked out. He was thrown out. He was voted out. That's who God's going to use. Who led the Israelites out of the Red Sea? Some little slave boy, some little 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 slave baby that was in the bulrushes and his mommy made him a basket and tried to hide him in the water. Some little slave boy. Who did God use to lead the children of Israel out of, into the promised land? An outcast. An outcast slave boy that nobody else wanted. An outcast slave boy that was destined to be killed. That's who God used. That's who he did. Who are the people that he used? He used a mighty bunch of outcasts. David. They brought David out, and they brought David out, and they brought all his brothers out, and this, that, and the other. He was the least likely of Jesse's boy. Jesse said, that can't be the one. They, Jesse had all his boys pray through there, and, and Jesse was like, well, I got one more left, but, but he's not really that great. He's, he's kind of nobody wants him. He's out there with the sheep, and, and who, did, who did God use? He used an outcast. He used the one that nobody would have picked. To play football. Nobody would have picked if we were having a, a schoolyard uh, a team a, a team game or, or, or playing, a, I don't even know what that game is. What's that? Dodgeball. That's who he used. He used his outcasts. Who else did he use? He used an old drunk baseball player named Billy Sunday to dry up this country. That's who he used. That's who he used. He wound up in a mission one day. He, he he was drunk and, pat and, and, and just starting to wake up and he stumbled into some old mission somewhere and he got saved. That's who he used. He used an outcast to change America. He didn't pass the ordination test. He couldn't even pass the test when he tried to get ordained as an ordained preacher. 
Charles Hadley Spurgeon, he was voted out. He was voted out of the London's Bam London Baptist Convention. He was voted out. He was an outcast. That's who he uses. God uses outcasts. That's who he's going to use. John Wesley, he was an outcast. He preached on the streets. There was a time where there wasn't a single pulpit open to John Wesley. There wasn't one single place where he could preach. I think he ended up preaching on his, his dad's tombstone, and, he, and that was the one place where he could preach at. John Bunyan, he was an outcast. He wrote Pilgrim's Process. Progress on milk bottle stoppers. That's how he wrote them. He was in prison. He was an outcast in prison. And they would give him these bottles of milk. And that was part of his, his rations for the day. And he would take the little milk bottle stoppers. And he would write that book that he wrote. And, and, and he, was, he was an outcast stuck in prison. That's who God uses. Who wrote Romans? An outcast. Who wrote Galatians? An outcast. Who wrote Ephesians? An outcast. Who wrote Philippians? Colossians? First, Thessalon First Second Thessalonians? First Second Timothy? An outcast. Paul? An outcast. That's who wrote those books. And that's who God's going to use. Titus? Flaming? Hebrews? Who wrote those? Paul? Who wrote Revelation? Who wrote First John? Second John? Third John? An outcast on the Isle of Patmos. An outcast. Somebody threw it into jail. Somebody nobody cared about. Somebody that they threw away. That's who God used to write all those books was an outcast. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the first five books in the Bible was written by... Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, outcast. First five books in the Bible written by Moses. An outcast. A little slave boy that nobody wanted. A little, a little Hebrew child that nobody wanted. An outcast. God uses outcasts. Thank God he uses outcasts. Thank God he don't use the, the blue bloods and the high and mighty. And thank God he uses people like me and you. Man, that does something for me that he's able to use people like us. That's all he's ever going to use. And that's all he ever has used. He'll use the rich man's money and he'll use things like that. But I'm telling you right now, he's always going to pick the outcast. You don't believe me? Look at your Bible. Every time, where did he go? He always went to the outcast. All the other people were wanting to wine him and dine him and take him to the temple. And they were saying, Jesus, come over here. We're having a big feast. We're having this, that, and the other. Where did he go? Every time he ran right over there to that leper. Every time he ran right over there to that short little guy named Zacchaeus. That's where he ran to every time. He always went to the outcast. He was attracted to the outcast. And that's who he has a special place in his heart for is the outcast. I'm going to talk to you tonight about outcasts. Like I said, I'm going to get you out of here early. Number one, he gathereth the outcasts. That's what the Bible says. He gathers them. Okay? That, what that means is he saves the outcasts. He gathers them up. He doesn't grab them all at once. I'm telling you right now, when he grabs them, he grabs them one by one. That's what it means when you gather. When you gather firewood, what do you do? You grab this piece and you put it in your arm. And you grab this piece and you put it in your arm. You don't go bulldozing and grab them all. He grabbed them one at a time. They were important to him. He took time with them. He grabbed every single one of them one at a time. He gathered the outcasts. Okay? You got no money and, and nobody wants you? I'm telling you right now, Jesus wants you. He wants you. You're, uh, you're, you're not goodly to look upon and you think nobody likes you or nobody loves you? Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you. You may think that nobody has any time for you. Nobody cares for you. Jesus wants you. He wants the outcast. That's the people he wants. And that's who we should want as a church. The local New Testament church is the only institution that goes out and begs poor people to come to church. Okay? Every Thursday night, a group of four of us, we go out and knock doors, and we're begging people to come to church. We're begging people that don't have perfect lives. We're begging people that have troubles. We're begging them to come to church. We're trying to get them saved. We're showing them in the Bible how they can get saved. There's a good chance that we're not going to make any money out of them. And I can be honest with you. You're my Sunday night crowd. But what I'm saying is there's a good chance they're going to come here, and we're going to minister unto them. They're probably not going to ever give anything back to the church. Maybe they will. Maybe somewhere out there, I can't limit God, and maybe somewhere out there is a Sunday school teacher. Maybe somewhere out there is a nursery worker. Maybe there is someone out there. But eight times out of ten, it's going to be somebody that we're going to have to put money into them. We're going to invest time into them. And we may not ever see it back. But I'm telling you, those are the outcasts. Those are the people that Jesus came and died for. That's what the local New Testament church is supposed to do. We're supposed to go out there and help them. We're supposed to go out there and help their marriages and help their families. And I don't want you to ever think that I'm a business-minded person. I'm just saying the, the high and mighty corporations, they don't want them. 
They don't want to put any money into them. They don't want to because they'd say they'd be wasting their money. We're the only institution that I know of that'll go out and get them and go out and want them and go out and bring them in. And that's what we're supposed to do because they're the outcasts. Amen. And that's who Jesus has came for. Jesus wants to save the outcasts. He wants, if you're deep in sin tonight, if, if, if you're here and you're deep in sin and you're, you're, you think nobody wants you because you're so sinful and you're so dirty, Jesus wants you. He wants the outcasts. He gathers the outcasts. Number two, he gathers them up one by one and he wants them. He's going to gather up the outcasts. That's what he does. That's why we go out every Thursday night. We're trying to gather up the outcasts. We're trying to help him to gather up them outcasts and pick them up and dust them off and tell them how precious they are and how God loves them and how he died for them and how he sent his only son for them. Number two, he, sem he assembles the outcasts, the Bible said. If, if, you, if you do a search on the word outcast, like I said, it's, it's eight, eight times in the Bible. Look it up. Look it up this week. We all have computers. We all can Google stuff. Look it up, except for my mom. But um, anyway, uh, look, look it up. You know what I mean? I'll give it to her. I'll give her all the scriptures. But look it up. He, eight times in the Bible, the outcasts. Okay? He, it says he assembles the outcasts. You know what that means? It means he's going to take them to heaven. He's going to take them to heaven. He's going to assemble them up. And he's going to take them up to heaven with them. That's what he's talking about. He's assembling them. He's gathering them all together. We're out there and we're preaching this book and teaching this book and trying to get people saved. He's like, good, boom, there's one. Oh, hey, I got another one over here. And he's gathering them up. And he's gathering them up. And he's setting them over here. And he's like, all right, someday, someday soon, I'm taking them up there to be with me. Someday soon, I'm taking them all to heaven. He gathers up the outcasts, the Bible says. He loves the outcasts. He died for the outcasts. He wants the outcasts. Jesus wants to save the outcasts. No one else wants them. No one else has a time for them. No one else cares about them. Jesus wants them. Jesus wants the outcasts. He doesn't want the blue buds. The big corporations don't want them, but Jesus does. Jesus wants the outcasts. The high and mighty don't want the outcasts. They want the refined. They want the polished. They want the pretty people. Jesus wants the outcasts. That's who he came and died for. They want to refine. You know who else wants outcasts? I do. You know who else wants the outcasts? Swanton Baptist Church does. Jesus wants them. I want them. I want what he wants. We as Christians, that's who we should want. We should want the outcasts. We should want them. I want them. You want them. I know you do. The outcasts. In Isaiah 27, 13, it talks about the outcasts. They're going to rule in the mountain. They're going to become rulers. During, during the tribulation or after all that, you know, that end time prophecy stuff that I don't claim to know a lot about, don't really care to know a lot about because I know where I'm going when I die, but they're going to be the rulers. Those that are last shall be first, and those that are first shall be last. That's what they're talking about, okay? All those people that are outcasts. I think of these uh, teachers in school, and, and I'm thinking of one right now, and, and uh, Maisie, it's, it's Miss Stevenson. And I think about how, how every time we go over there to Lewis, and every time we go to any kind of function, she's got four or five kids with her. And they're all bus kids. And they're all kids that are handicapped. And they're all kids that some of them can't talk, and some of them can't hear, and some of them can't walk. And every time she goes in there, she goes in there and she takes them to church with her. They have some kind of, any kind of thing, whether it's a basketball game or, a, or a, some kind of activity. And she grabs all them kids and she takes them to church. And uh, no doubt there are a lot of trouble for her. And no doubt that's, a, that, that's kind of an inconvenience to her. But I'm telling you right now, those that are last shall be first. What I'm trying to tell you is, Maisie, is when we get to heaven and a lot of these big time preachers, they think that Jesus is going to come up and he's going to shake their hand first. He's going to say, excuse me, I want to see Miss Stevenson. He's going to say, can you step out of the way, you preacher that had over 400,000 in your congregation and you make a trillion dollars. I don't really care about you right now. I want to come down there and talk to her. I want to talk to that little lady that every week is out there running a bus route and trying to get them little kids to come to church and them, them educably slow and the, the handicapped and the deaf. That's who he wants. And that's who he's going to come and talk to. And that's who Jesus is going to put in front of the line. That's what I'm talking about. The outcasts. Luke 19.10, seeking to save that which was lost. That's what the Bible says. It says he came to seeking to save that which was lost. 
Jesus came to seek and to save what? In Luke chapter 15, it talks about a lost coin. It talks about a lost boy. It talks about a lost sheep. He came to seek and to save what? The lost. That's who he came. He came to seek the outcast. He never came for the, the 99. The Bible says that he came for the one. And just like I told you, he stopped. And he would literally stop. And he would go over there to the one that no one else wanted. He would stop and go over here for the one that no one else wanted. If you're a widow, I'm telling you right now, Jesus came for the outcast. I think that Jesus cares more for the widows than he does for a woman that has a husband. And don't, don't, don't think that he doesn't love you. He loves us. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just telling you, there's a little special place in his heart for the widow. There's a little special place in his deaf over those that can hear. There's a little special place in his heart for the orphan compared to the one that had a father. There's a little, little special place. Um, he, he's more concerned about the sick than the well. He's more concerned about the bus kid than possibly my and Tina's kids. He's more concerned about the, the guy down at the Cherry Street Mission than he is about me. I can guarantee you that right now. The little mission man. The mission man that's spent his whole life. And I'll tell you right now, there's not one person better than one person out there. There's not no one better than no one else out there. And I'm telling you right now, if we're thinking that we're getting cheated and we think that we're getting robbed, I'm telling you, but by the grace of God, Brother Bob, we'd be down there at Cherry Street Mission if it wasn't for that. Can you see how big of a chance it is and how big of, how God's hand is on your life and, and Brother Keith if it, if it wasn't for the grace of God we'd be high on dope and we'd be down there at that Cherry Street Mission instead of living in our nice dry warm house every night that could be us we could be on skid row God hates pride and he hates a proud look and I'm telling you right there there's nobody better than anyone else where did Jesus go when he came to town when he came to Jericho he came to blind Bartimaeus that's who he came to, blind Bar Bartimaeus begging him on the road. He came to Zacchaeus, that little short man that nobody wanted to have nothing to do with. That's who he came to, that everyone despised. That's the house that he went to. He went to the pool of Bethesda. 38 years that man sat down there at the pool of Bethesda and waited. They said if you waited beside the pool and he was lame, that angel would come down and would stir the waters. And stir the waters and then somebody, that guy would beg for somebody to roll him in every day. Push him into the water so that he could be healed. 38 years. I'm going to be 40, 43 years, thanks mom, I'm going to be 43 years this year, 43 years old, 30, <clears throat> 38 years, 38 years that guy sat down there and waited, 38 years, where'd Jesus go? He went right down there, that's where he went to, 38 years man, waiting down there for, for that water to be stirred and Nobody else came down there and pushed him in. Nobody else helped him out. Nobody else would carry him in. 38 years, every day, get up in the morning and crawl down there. Every day, get up and have somebody carry you down there, whatever you had to do. And then everybody else would jump in before he got in. 38 years. That's who he went. That's where he went. At the cross, he won a poor sinner. Jesus loved the outcast. That poor sinner on the cross, he told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's who he loved, the outcast. That was right up his alley. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I don't mean to belittle him, but that was just perfect that that guy was there on the cross like that with him. That was, that was just a testimony to our Savior and how much he loves people. Maybe you're here and your life's been ruined by alcohol. Jesus wants you. No one else may want you, but Jesus does. Homeless person, you may not look like much. You may look at him downtown and... I think we get numb, Brother Bob, in this whole life, and we drive by and all we see is a shopping cart and the, the blankets all covered up and the dirty matted hair and things like that. But they got hearts, and they got souls, and they matter to God. God loves the outcast. That's all He can use is the outcast. Jesus wanted them. He gathers them up. He picks them up one by one. Jesus loves the outcast. If you're an outcast tonight... I don't care how it is or what it is. You're wanted here. Outcasts are going to be wanted in this church. I'm going to make sure of it. It's my mission that we're going to want the outcasts. And like I said this morning, if I'm going to want the outcasts, I'm going to need people to teach them. I'm going to need people to preach to them. I'm going to need people to give them kind words of encouragement. And that's where you come in at. If I'm going to go after the outcasts, I need people. I need people to help me. I need people to put their hand to the plow and say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to join you up. I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a difference in this world. Blind, you're wanted. Blind person, you're an outcast, you're wanted. Deaf person, you're wanted. 
Poor person, you're wanted. Widow, you're wanted. Single mother tonight. He wants you. He wants the outcasts. I think sometimes, Brother Larry, I think of those, those migrant workers that come up here. And I remember going to Brother Howard's and somewhere out there, there's some migrant worker farm. I can remember on the way to his house. And I thought, man, how special it would be to go out there and pass out some gospel tracts, some Spanish tracts, and maybe hook up with a pastor that's a, a Spanish fellow that, that, can, that can preach and teach in Spanish. And maybe we could go out there and get him saved. I got all kinds of crazy stuff going through my head. That's who Jesus wants. He wants the outcast. Those people that no one else wants. That's who he wants. And that's who I want. And that's who Swanton Baptist Church should, should want. You're not anything and neither am I. And the minute that we think we're something, that's when we're fooling ourselves. God wants the outcasts. Jesus wants the outcasts. All are welcome. He wants all the outcasts to come to Him. He wants all the outcasts to, to gather them up. And He wants to take care of them. And He wants to bind up their wounds. And He wants to take care of them. I got one more scripture and then I'm going to... Then I'm going to close out. <clears throat> Isaiah 61. <clears throat> I think it's verse number one. <clears throat> I love this uh, scripture. It's actually two times in the Bible. It's here and then I think it's in Matthew um, or Mark. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captains and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's what I'm talking about right there. I'm talking about to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. How many people are brokenhearted out there? How many people have their hearts been stomped on and their lives have been smashed and their dreams have been smashed and they're, and they're down and out and they're brokenhearted? God, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to bandage them up. He didn't come to poke them and prod them and come to kick them down while they were down. He came to pick them up and bandage them. That's what he came for, the brokenhearted. I love that. And I think that's what we should do as Christians. I think that should be our mission. And when it says proclaim liberty to the captives, this is what it's talking about. Liberty to the captives. How can you get free from that sin in your life? By getting saved. By getting born again. Man, if people would just believe me and listen to me, how much easier it is when you got this book and when you got salvation in your heart and when you got the Holy Spirit dwelling in inside you. How much easier life is. And it ain't easy being a Christian. Don't get me wrong. But it is so much easier having someone you can talk to. And He will change your life. And He will change your direction. And He will take those things out of your life that have bound you and pull you and try to drag you in. He'll change that. He'll change it to where the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to want, I don't want them anymore. That's what He'll do to you, Maisie. He'll change you. So you don't want that stuff anymore. You don't need that stuff anymore. And that's what He does. Bind the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound. Opening of prison to them that are bound. Bound by sin. Bound and going to be cast into the lake of fire because they won't give up that unbelief and they won't give in and give in to Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. He's going to cut them loose. And how does he do that? By getting them saved. And how does he do that? By us going after the outcasts. And by us going after them and preaching to them. By us being, being humble enough to, to say, you know what? Maybe you don't smell like you should. Maybe you don't look like you should. But I guarantee if my Savior was here, You'd be the first person he'd be coming after. And that's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be going after the outcasts. We need to be going after the people nobody wants. People are not taking time for people anymore. Okay, those young single mothers, they got nobody for them but Jesus. We got to go out there and we got to get them. Those fathers that are, that are wayward, everybody's give up on them. If you haven't noticed, the whole world's give up on them. They're a big deal. They just throw money at the problem. We'll just build them a new school. That'll fix it. No, it won't. No, it won't. You've got to fix the families. You've got to fix the family unit. You've got to fix the marriage. You've got to build that. You've got to protect that. You've got you to take care of that. 
And if, if, if the marriage is broken, you got to heal it. If you can't heal it, you got to salvage something out of it. You got to salvage that young mother. You got to salvage that young baby. We got to go after them. We got to get them saved. We got to show them. How do we show them? By how we live. We don't show them by what we do, by not coming back on a Sunday night, or by not coming back on a Wednesday night, or what we have on Facebook, what we're doing this time, or what we're doing that time. And I'm telling you right now, I don't care what anybody does. I don't care what anybody thinks, Brother Bob. I'm the one that's going to answer for me. That's right. God's going to deal with me for what I've done. And I can't get mad at them, and I can't get bothered by them, but I sure can preach to them every chance I get and talk to them. And I sure can proclaim the gospel every time I get a chance to, and I can show them how much better it is. And maybe, maybe someday they'll look back at mine and Tina's life and they'll say, man, they stuck with the stuff, and man, they've had a good life, and I want that. I want what they have. And how are they going to do that if we don't go after the outcasts? If we don't go after them, God wants the outcast. You're in church tonight, you're the outcast. Okay? You got to be crazy or something. But God wants you. God can use you. I don't know, Brother Kenny. I don't know if he can use me. You know, Brother Kenny, you preach and you sing. And you, have you heard me sing? Seriously, come on, people. God can use anybody. Okay? I can't carry a tune with that. 20-gallon water tank or a water truck. I, 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 I'm just doing what I can do. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to stand up, okay? And I'm, 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 I'm sick of going to bed at night. Back in the day, I don't do that anymore. Now I just sleep. But used to just going to bed thinking, man, I could do more. Man, I could do more. Man, I could do more. And I'm going to do it. And uh, whatever happens, happens because... Um, I just, I just got to do what he wants, and he's going to bless me. I know he is. Don't count out the outcasts. We're the outcasts. God's going to use us. I'm, and I'm not even, I mean, we're not the blue buds. We're not the rich people. We're not the high and mighty corporations. We're the outcasts. God can use us. God used all through the Bible outcasts. God used normal men all through the Bible. God used men that sinned. God used men that committed sin. They fell, and then God gave them other chances. Just, there's so many good things in this book. Let's pray.